I'm Annalie Newitz. I'm the tech culture editor at Ars Technica. And Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Gooden. I'm security editor at Ars Technica. And he is the author of many awesome articles. And we are super, super lucky to have Morgan Marquis Boire here today with us, um, who I've been begging to come. And I wanted to say before we get started, that, um, and before Morgan dances on the table, that um, this is a, an event that we've been planning for a while. I asked Morgan to come speak here a couple months ago. I want, uh, and so this was not something that we put together in the wake of the election. Um, and I want you to think about the fact that the issues that we're talking about tonight, they may seem like they've taken on a new urgency because of the recent election, but these are topics that we should be thinking about no matter who is elected president. Um, these are topics that are of great urgency to people outside the United States. They're a matter of life and death for a lot of people. So this is not about the election. This is about just the state of the world and the state of politics and um, digital safety uh, as we know them. So thanks again for being here, Morgan, to talk to us. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to ask how, how you got started with, with hacking. Like, were there formative experiences for you that made you want to go into computer security and study these issues as a researcher? Like, what, you know, what, what's your origin story? You know, ha hacking now, you know, and I, and I, it means something different than it did when I was a teenager. And I, I, I used to get very worked up about this, and I'm, I'm fine with having lost that battle. Now everyone who is a software engineer is a hacker, and everyone who cooks is a food hacker, and everyone who sews is a clothing hacker. And that's fucking fine. I don't give a shit. No, no. I, I actually really do care about that. That pisses me off. But, but anyway, because uh, hacking used to be about breaking into computers. Um, and, and that's a very second wave definition. Um, I know, like it, it used to be about building operating systems. But we were the ones that made it cool, right? Because you actually had to have the moxie to stump up and do something illegal. Um, not that I did, but, but no, so I mean, th there were a lot of formative experiences. So I mean, I, I was lucky enough to fall in with a sort of disreputable group of um, highly skilled uh, computer geeks. And so, so we, we had a, an apartment, which I am still very fond of, is this sort of giant warehouse. And so we did things like we ran New Zealand's first anonymous remailer, sort of prior to things like Tor. Like a remailer was, um, it's like a system by which you, you send an email and it sends it on to another email server and another email server and so on. Um, and it reaches the final destination and you can send email anonymously. Um, and obviously the potential for abuse of such a system is large. So we did things like we actually built this inside one of the walls because we were convinced that the police would come to raid our pad in the night and seize our thing. And so, so, so you know, we actually sort of built this into the walls. So you wouldn't even be able to tell where this machine was in our apartment. So, you know, we, we, we did a variety of stuff like that. Um, we did things which now would probably seem really foolish, like we sort of ran a public exploit archive and allowed people to vulnerability scan the internet from, like, our network and stuff like that, which is, is also, like, now I'm like, wow, that's... You just wouldn't do that. That would seem hideously irresponsible. Uh, yeah, and we ran like a public test lab, which you were actually allowed to hack. Like we, we invited people to, to hack it. In fact, the power bills in that place were just insanely expensive because we ran like 30 pieces of spinning rust, uh, which kept us really warm in winter. But that, I mean, that was, that was the public network that people were allowed to hack. So, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's you know, good, good times in New Zealand in my teenage years. For you, as you were developing um, new skills, uh, did you feel like hacking was necessarily political? <laughs> So I did, but the rest of the people in my group did not, specifically. I didn't actually study computer science at university. I actually have a degree in politics. Um, so I have a degree in politics and philosophy. So I was actually, I, I mean, I, I got sort of roped into this because I, I, I discovered open source and was like, oh my god, this is an amazing idea. The idea of, you know, people giving away their time and ideas for free so you don't have to replicate effort. This, like, really makes sense. It's a problem-solving approach to me. Like, I would really love to learn more about this culture and this world. I have always sort of seen a political edge to it, but I know a lot of people haven't, although that... <laughs> It differs a lot whether or not you're American or European. Um, I think the, the European hacker scene has always been more political, um, but it, it sort of speaks, I think, to the you know, different nature of, of... So in America, there's a lot more of a, you know, the lone hacker against you know, telcos, large corporates, and that sort of thing, which, which also speaks to a lot of the narratives that exist in the American psyche, whereas I think in, in Europe, there's, there's a lot more... I, th I think there's a, a, a longer history of sort of hacking as a political protest and, and that sort of thing. I, I was curious to know um, about your current gig working for, for First Look and, and specifically defending Glenn Greenwald and other journalists. You are defending him against 
some of the arguably some of the most sophisticated uh, state sponsored hackers in the world. You've worked for, for Google, you've done uh, penetration testing, you've worked for a lot of different places. What's it like to defend journalists, not only just any journalist, but journalists like that versus working for you know, Google or, or some of these other large companies? It, it's been interesting because I, I think actually all, all of the jobs that I've sort of done have lent me different perspectives. Like I, I really enjoyed working as a penetration tester because I, I got to work as a penetration tester, I think I started 15 years ago now. Um, I'm kind of old, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I liked that job because I got to break into computers and I got paid for it, which I actually didn't think was a real thing at the time. Like, like I mean, it, it, was, it was strange and bizarre. I spent a lot of time pinching myself uh, because this was something that I would probably want to be doing anyway. In fact, enjoyed doing so much that I might do it for free. Um, but, but I mean, the great, I mean, <laughs> it sounds bad, but, um, but no, I, I really enjoyed that job. But the, the thing was is that you, <laughs> you mostly always won and that sounds great, but it actually became really, really depressing. And so, for instance, like I would show up to do a job and it would be, be someone that I'd actually previously hacked and I'd written a report and said all of this stuff is bad and wrong. And then um, I'd come back a year later and I'd take a cursory look at them and be like, all of your stuff is still bad and wrong. It's, it's like you didn't listen to me at all. You know, I, I don't feel valued. I don't feel loved, you know. Um, and, and I mean, I, I, eventually I actually found that quite distressing. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that was sort of around the time I, I stopped being a pen tester and went to work for Google, which, of course, is a very different set of problems because when you're a pen tester, you can move really fast. And so, for instance, I would show up at Google and they would be, you know, they're like, oh, you're the new guy. You should do, like, this task. You know, like, how long do you think it'll take you? I'm like, oh, I don't know. 70 hours and they're like <laughs> no, this is going to take you two quarters i'm like you you got to be shitting me like what and like yeah it's sort of le learning the difference between being sort of like an uh, a small team of consultants um you know largely critiquing and QAing other people's work to actually you know working in a a really large scale environment on truly ambitious projects you know things take a lot longer um i mean i had a really good time time working there and i i I thought it was a uh, fantastic security team. Um, but then, yeah, as I said, I, as, you, as you mentioned, I, I moved um, to be the director of security at First Look. And now we have a bunch of troublemaking journalists that get leaked documents. And one of the things that I like about it over working at Google is, is that Google is large and, let's say, functionally infinitely resourced for the purposes of this discussion, as opposed to a, a small, highly mobile company. But I don't have a security team of 300 mystical unicorns to you know, do my bidding, right? Like, we, we have to sort of make do with what we've got. Uh, on the other side of things, like, there's, the, the attack surface is much, much smaller. Because, you know, Google is a lot of the internet, whereas, you know, the stuff we're protecting isn't. So you can actually start doing things like, oh, uh, well, if we don't want people to be able to get to it, maybe, maybe we should just never put it online. Like, yeah, let's do that. You know, um, so I mean, I'm saying, saying you, you, you can come up with those sorts of approaches, which is really not feasible when you're in a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook, right? So, I mean, there are different challenges. The, the thing that, that, that still really does my head in about trying to protect journalists, and as people here who've worked in that industry will know, is that arbitrary documents... Like, you're a journalist, your job is to open random documents that people you don't know send you. Like, hey, I have this great scoop, it's really interesting, it's Donald Trump's tax returns or Obama's birth certificate or, you know, whatever, right? And, and the thing is that, like, as a journalist, it's kind of paralyzing because it's, it's your job to open this. The regular sort of security authoritarianism, which sort of beats deep within my soul, is, like, really difficult to apply here, which is, like hey, yeah, like, basically I'd like you to just listen to me and never do any of the things that I'm telling you not to do. Like, that's really difficult to enforce with journalists. So it's, it's had new and interesting challenges. I've been wondering something that perhaps you can answer, which is, I know that you've been um, all over the world teaching different groups about how to have um, better security if they're whistleblowers or if they're subversives or journalists under closed regimes. And I'm wondering... What signs do we look for to see whether we're entering an era of greater digital authoritarianism? Basically, what are the red flags? Um, are there red flags? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like top 10 list of biggest red flags in, <laughs> in digital authoritarianism and surveillance. And normally when you talk about red flags, like, 
is it really a red flag if you have to go through 10 of them in order to bail, right? Like, cause, cause that's, it's a lot of flags. Uh, you, you know, Let's um, say like, yeah, you know. Flag it, fatigue. Yeah, um, it, any one of those might be a yeah, flag. But like, what are the things that we should be aware of? And right, let, Let's start with the digital authoritarianism. Because I, I mean, I think that there's, it suggests something that isn't real. And, and, and what I mean is, is that, that, that somehow the internet is, is this ephemeral imaginary place, that it's not the real world, which, which is, is not true, right? Like, I mean, so, so much of life occurs online now. I mean, obviously we live in the Bay Area, so that's probably like heavily exacerbated. So everyone here probably like orders their groceries online and stuff. But even if that's actually not, not true, um, I guess what I mean is, is that the, the bulk of sort of communications, commerce, um, you know, and now, of course, with the internet of broken stuff um you know people's children's toys cars are online cars you know m medical equipment i'm self-quantifying now i'll be able to see you know my heart rate raise as i don't get that drink i ordered um you know but uh, over the course of th this thing and right like so i think when we sort of talk about digital authoritarianism it's slightly misleading because it implies that it's different from actual authoritarianism mm -hmm. which it it really isn't like it's it, Digital authoritarianism is simply sort of a, a method of control um, to enforce the same tawdry, mundane agendas that authoritarians have been trying to enforce since that was a thing. <laughs> For me, the secret courts was a big one. Uh, like, that's, that's not a digital thing, right? There was sort of like literal courts with alternative interpretations of the Constitution, which most people didn't know existed. That's very, very concerning. I was surprised, to say the least. I think when your intelligence and law enforcement agencies are operating in manners that they choose to keep, not just secret, but as almost deceptive with regard to the whole population. For instance, like, you know, how many people here knew that there was large scale surveillance of Americans occurring before the Snowden documents were released, right? I mean, <laughs> but, but I mean, like, that, this, this is a thing that most people actually thought was forbidden. Um, so, I mean, like, we've, we've got sort of a couple of, uh, of, of serious red flags already. So, I mean, I, I think that, that that type of thing is very concerning. And, and there, are, there are probably some lawyers here who'll, who'll know the, the in-depth of it more than I will. But the Apple versus FBI case, sort of Crypto Wars version 2, super concerning, right? Like, oh, you shouldn't really make a product so secure that the American government can't circumvent it. Like, really? Really? So we, we, we shouldn't make reliable products here, right? Like, that, like th this, is, this is a return to a narrative that we had in the late 80s. There's sort of a lot of sort of signs. There's good things too, but, but yeah, like, th there's definitely been <laughs> red flags, as you say. In the wake of the election, there have been a lot of protests. What do people need to be concerned about in terms of um, government surveillance, police surveillance? How can people protect themselves if they want to go out and peacefully protest, which is part of our right as Americans to peaceably assemble and, you know, make ourselves heard? I'm thinking a lot about, you know, these specific devices, which I would argue that probably like 99% of people here are actually have a sort of glued to their person right now. It's, it's a double-edged sword, right? Both a blessing and a curse because it's not so much that police have just recently started brutalizing people it's now that we have increased capacity to document it um and so there are some really positive things on that on the on the other side of things you know, actually sort of to to retouch on that european u.s divide here so so for instance in europe if you're attending a demo right and you bring your cell phone you are a snitch a narc and a fool right like you are, you are deliberately endangering the people that you are going to a protest with. Because of course, you know, this particular device knows exactly where I am at all times, which means that Comcast knows exactly where I am at all times, or T-Mobile, or Sprint, or whoever. And that means that law enforcement knows where you were, what you were doing, and so forth. On the other side of things, maybe you really, really, really do want to videotape the police illegally searching your friend or beating them down. So I mean, there's, <laughs> as I said, when it comes to the double-edged sword, uh, you know, pr protesting is kind of different um, than, than it used to be. And I, I think it depends on the type of protesting you're doing and what your goals are. Uh, I am sure everybody here is only interested in peaceful and ineffective protest. So that, was like, <laughs> hey, that came out wrong. I'm sorry. Um, Tell us how you really <laughs> feel, though, Morgan. <laughs> He's a great, by the way. Um, no, no. Um, it's difficult to give people like a sort of a three-point set of rules to say like this this will definitely keep you safe there are a few things which i think are worth bearing in mind and i it, it's, it's sort of not technically comp complicated it's more you know if there is stuff on your phone that 
you would prefer that law enforcement not see, maybe you should not take it into an environment where the police are going to act irrationally with regard to large groups of people, right? Like temperatures will be high. You know, they like to do things like kettle people, take people's phones, demand that you unlock them and so forth, which you know, may or may not be illegal in the state of California. How much you want to stand on principle in certain situations is up to the individual. Thinking about the data that you're trying to protect, what you're trying to keep safe, what your concerns are, if you are actually trying to organize some form of direct action, then obviously actually using secure communications, preferably secure and ephemeral communications, maybe self-deleting communications, probably a good idea. I have actually been in situations where people have been like, YOLO, what's the worst that can happen? And as it turned out, the worst that could happen in this situation, I mean, they were nice white folk, but so they just got thrown in jail. Let me step in. What are three specific apps that people should have on their phones? What, what are three specific safeguards that, that, that people should take to try to insulate themselves or protect themselves the best they can? I'm a little loath to advocate like a tools-based approach to security because, I mean, if, if we, like, let, let's draw an analogy with like physical health. Like, say you go to a doctor and you're like, doc, what are three things I can do to be healthy? The doctor will look at you and probably say, you should exercise, eat right, and you know, get enough sleep or don't smoke, stay away from heroin. It's difficult for me to advocate like a specific app or something like that that people install. Like, I like Signal. I think Signal's a great secure communication app. It has disappearing messages. It does all sorts of things. It is designed to do a very specific thing, much like getting inoculated against, you know, tetanus or something like that, right? I think using secure messaging apps when you're messaging people about sensitive topics is a good idea. Um, so, and by secure messaging apps, you mean Signal, WhatsApp, maybe? Yes. WhatsApp has Signal protocol. Uh, Facebook has secure messages. I think evaluating whether or not you need your phone, um, with well, whether or not you need your phone, this phone right now, like you could get a twenty-dollar one that's not yours. Think about turning it off. Also fun. Um, think. I think thinking seriously about sort of holistically, like holistic medicine, right? Think about data contraception, right? Like think about the data that you're creating and whether or not you want to be doing that. It's, you know, it's like constantly taking photos at protests and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's really great to show all of your friends on social media that you're protesting and you believe in something. And that, no, that, no, and I honestly mean that, right? That could be really positive, right? I think it's important, you know, to show solidarity, community, and that sort of thing. On the other side of things, it may not be a great idea to take photos of those people smashing that bank window uh, because the police will take your phone and then they're going to want to talk to you. And so then, you're talking yeah, about right? oversharing, right? Right. right. And so, I mean, like, again, well, again, think about the data you create, what you do with it, and, and that sort of thing. And that, that's more like you should get some exercise. You know, the type of exercise you get is up to you, but you should really think about how you do it, right? Like... You're, you're largely thinking about the consequences that you have. That this right. is this is data that you're creating, and once you create data, it's very, very, very difficult to ever really destroy it, unless this is an app like Signal that has some sort of ephemeral messaging or something that has been tested to to actually work the way we we expect it to work, right? I was just thinking of my my fondest data destruction job, and I was actually paid to do this, and that I was I was in a car park with a blowtorch um burning this stack of cds and it's like what the hell are you doing i'm like this is this is billable time like i i, I i'm being paid to pay, paid to do this we're in a really interesting time because there's there's a lot of media coverage about cybersecurity, about technology a lot of it is very influential on 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 the world right now even if people don't really understand it in, in granular terms so i mean for instance like the the russian hacking in the u.s election right like this is, this is a big news story. Most people don't really understand the, the whys and wherefores of it, and that's because it's international espionage is complex and difficult, as is, and Russian disinformation is mind-boggling even to dedicated criminologists. Think about what you're trying to protect and who you're trying to protect it from. So, for instance, you're in a bar right now. What you are probably trying to protect is maybe... Well, who you're trying to protect it from is probably your drunk-ass friends, and what you're trying to stop happening is them updating your Facebook status with something embarrassing, right? And you probably understand the security measures that you have to go through in order to protect yourself in that scenario. Because you've probably thought about this because it's a very real scenario to you, um, and it may have happened to you, right? Especially if you're a friend of mine. Th that's actually like a really key first step, uh, much like thinking about your physical health. Like, I mean, th think about what you're trying to keep safe and from whom, and actually just spend a few moments you know, whenever possible, actually thinking about it. Well, so one right. of the things that a lot of people need to think about is their, uh, you know, their Facebook data or their Gmail account. So two-factor authentication is a no-brainer, is it? Is it not? 
Yes. I, I say yes because it's a great idea. I really like it. It's actually real security, and much like real security, it's super inconvenient. Um, and so, 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 I mean, I, for instance, I had a friend that was traveling, and then she lost her phone. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, she's like, you know, Morgan, tell me a magical way that I can now get past two-factor authentication. And I'm like, well, no, you see, that's the thing. It's real security. It's not, it's not optional. It's not like a magic trick. That's the, that's, that's the whole point of having security measures that actually work. It means if you lose this, did you, did you print out those codes? Like, oh, they're at home in your desk drawer? Cool, well, you're screwed until you get home. Which, of course, when you're traveling, that massively inconvenient. Um, but I mean, it's real security. Like, it, it, it does stuff. Like, pe people, if you have security concerns, you should definitely enable it. So these are very powerful tools, and people should not enable them unless they really understand. No, they... I think they should enable them anyway. I don't really care about the inconvenience of, you know. But people would love to think that security is magical and won't inconvenience them. And that's not necessarily true. And for instance, if we think about physical security, like, th think about a house or a room that's physically secure, right? Like, you have bars on windows, you have walls made out of titanium and stuff like this. This is not a very, you know, inviting place, but th this is what you get with physical security. And, you know, th there's, there's a touch of that with digital security, too, in that, like, two-factor authentication is a really great way of keeping people out of your online accounts. And I think it's really great that Facebook and Google enabled them. Some people are like, this should be compulsory. And I have mixed feelings on that because I think that it's going to cause a lot of people to be like, oh my god, I lost my phone, I lost the bit of paper, I will never be able to get my account back. What about the issue of simply having a friendship network that you can see in Facebook or Google that, I mean, someone can see even if they're not even in your account um, or someone who's gotten access to your Gmail, you know, maybe law enforcement can start to figure out who your contacts are, who your friends are. Is there any way to you know, defend against that? I mean, is it just don't make any friends on Facebook? Is it, you know, make a bunch of fake friends to kind of oh. hide everything in a Actually, haze? Actually, wrote a really good blog post on this. What was it called? Social, Social media? media yeah, that was really good. Um, so, uh, so go read Social Media that, Self-Defense. Yeah. It's a hard problem is the short answer, but that's a good blog post on it. Uh, Snowden retweeted it, I remember. Uh, <laughs> that's a good start, but, though. Yeah, that's yeah, it's, it's a good start. Like, it's, it's a tough problem, and there's, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of tough issues around this, right? Like, um, I think there was a joke a while ago that when Orwell wrote 1984, he didn't predict that we would be the ones holding the cameras, right? And, and, and this is, <laughs> I mean, now everybody is, is documenting uh, everything they're doing. A lot of my social media accounts are public. So, for instance, you know, like my Twitter and that sort of thing, which means that it is reasonably trivial to see, for instance, like who I talk to the most. Mm -hmm. Um, in which, and I, I've had friends who've been like, well, I got this email from you saying you should install this. I'm like, yeah, don't ever do, don't like, if you get an email from me that says like, hey, we should go to a bar on Saturday, that's me. If you get an email from me saying, yeah, you should really install this app that I have attached, definitely not me. Um, <laughs> and they were like, how would they know that we're friends? How, how is this possible? And it's like, we talk on Twitter all the time. That's, that's public. So, I mean, that's, that's rough, right? Like, it, it, it is a very difficult problem. And, again, there are some guides and stuff out there that, that start to try to address this. But you actually have to be reasonably dedicated to trying to solve that problem if you're going to do it. Imagine you're a median Google employee, software tech employee, right? So you've, you've enabled um, two-factor authentication. You know, maybe you can, you're using LastPass or something like that. But you don't understand the principles of like of good digital security right you're just you're doing these things because you've been told oh. to. and so like where would you go who would you listen to um, who do you read um to develop that more principled base if you have time yeah there's a book by ross anderson called security engineering and it is not just about digital security he talks about identify friend or foe systems he talks about banking security double entry bookkeeping like all sorts of things like this is a fascinating book for understanding sort of security primitives and again like not just it's not about code security it's not just about digital security but how security systems are designed across the board like it, it is a fascinating read it's also you know i mean the great thing is is you can open it and say like i'm interested in fissile material security and just open it and read that chapter Right, like I mean, which I found fascinating because I'm a computer security geek, so I know 
you know, I, I am very much the layman when it comes to <laughs> secure nuclear materials. But it was, I mean, like that, that's that's a that's a really good book to read in terms of sort of understanding. Like a, a really, in, and he's he's a professor of security at Cambridge University uh, in the UK, so he's you know, sort of d definitive in, in this area. So it's it's, it's a good book. Any uh, blogs or uh, you know publications other than Ars Technica, of course, which you should be reading all the time. I I don't read anything other than Ars Technica. Good. Uh, <laughs> there's actually a lot of really good sort of security blogging out there. The sort of the style of the time right is actually to, to sort of follow people on Twitter and watch watch the security industry sort of bicker it out on topics du jour. But no, I actually, I mean, not just because it's an Ars Technica event, but I, I actually think that the quality of journalism on security reporting has increased massively in the last sort of, you know, eight to ten years or so. Like, it, it, you, it used to be laughably poor uh, when I was younger. Like, you, you just knew that if they were writing anything about hackers that it was going to be like, idiotic and almost definitely wrong. Um, whereas now I actually think a, a lot of the, the, the news media that's written about stuff is, is actually pretty good. Well, it's, it's really more of a discussion now, is, is it not? Where, I mean, there's, there, you, you see people hashing it out whether Tor is going to protect you or give you up, right? Or, or, or some of these types of things. There's good and bad things about that approach. I mean, I like it when I'm the person up high on the mountain and I get very angry about the fact that there's a peanut gallery who doesn't understand my wisdom. Um, I, I think that, that having an open forum for this sort of debate when it is not full of misogynist trolls is actually really cool. Um, but the, there, there are some problems with it, right? Like, so for instance, when, when, when the, the DNC hack, right? So this happens during the election. The DNC is hacked, documents are leaked, this mysterious individual calling themselves Goosefer 2.0 which is a ludicrous hacker name. Who names themselves after another hacker and then just appends 2.0 to it? Like that, it's just red like, flag number one. No, but, this is like the Pope, though. You know what right, I mean? Like, like you can be, oh. like, you know, it's think of it that way. Pope Pius Secundi. Like, yeah. 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 I think yeah. it would be Dino Daisovi 2.0. Like, okay. That sounds cool. What was uh, your, what was your but, first hacker name, though? The, it's the same as it is now. I'm still Headhunter. All right. So part of the problem with this, right, was that um, I remember some of the discussions going around Twitter about this hack is that, you know, it was said like, oh, you know, the, the Russians had hacked the DNC and that, that Guccifer was a cutout and, and this was a setup in an effort to sort of influence the election. And all of a sudden, there were actually some reasonably well-known infosec voices who were like, yeah, well, there's really no evidence which shows that it's Russia in this news. And I sort of messaged them. I was like, have you, have you looked at the malware? Have you analyzed this? Have you done any of this yourself? Because you're a smart guy and I know you could. And it's like, well, no. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just going on what I've read in the news. And it's like... Right, but you know when you say this stuff, people listen because you're kind of well known. And you're not thinking about this because you're just running your mouth on Twitter, which is what it's for. But then you see articles which say like, oh, you know, prominent security professionals, no agreement with an industry about, which is like, no, that's bullshit. Like, I actually know what's going on here. He's not even paying attention. Right, like he's just running at the mouth. But so I mean like it's it's kind of one of those things where it's like it, it's good that this discussion space exists, but I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, whether or not prominent security expert A is actually saying like, well, as someone who is expert in the subject, I believe X, or I woke up this morning with a really bad hangover and I'm in a pissed off mood and I just want to have a fight with some of my friends, right? Like discerning what, exactly what's going on can be, you know, somewhat impenetrable to the lay observer. People who become activists don't use activist apps when they start being activists. They use the tools that they have at their disposal, right? Whether that's email, Facebook. I'm a big fan of using Signal, but what is it that the companies that create the tools that all of us use in our daily lives can do? I actually really liked what you said there when you said, you know, like, activism. I mean, because a lot, a lot of people don't even understand that they're starting to do activism when they start, right? Like, you feel strongly about something and you want to get out there and... Um, there's, there's a great paper written by um, Ethan Zuckerman, the cute cats in the Arab Spring, right, which I, I, I love, um, when he actually says, you know, what people love on the internet is cute cat pictures and cute cat videos. <laughs> this is a universally acknowledged truth. Um, and it is actually really hard to shut down platforms which are primarily purveyors of cat pictures, like in cat videos, say YouTube. It is pretty easy to shut down specialized activist tools. So for instance, uh, I mean, like, let's look at, at, at Signal versus sort of Facebook secret messenger. Signal is not immensely funded, <laughs> right? As, as most people probably know, it, it is a reasonably small team of people. So actually deciding that you're gonna block all traffic to Signal servers on the border 
uh, of your country is actually probably not that difficult. However, if you decided that you were going to shut down Facebook Messenger for the entire con country because Facebook now has secret chats, which are encrypted between individuals, then that's, that's an international news story, right? Like, you know, country X kills Facebook Messenger for entire country. And now you have a massive amount of collateral damage, right? You have, you know, 20, 30 million pissed off people because this is primarily how they chat with their school friends or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I think that's a really good point. I think that a lot of companies are actually building these baked in security messages. So, a method, so as I, I mentioned Facebook secret chats, freaking iPhone, right? Like your iMessage, if it's iPhone to iPhone, is actually encrypted by default. I mean, there's some debate amongst the, the great and the good of the security community about how warrant responsive that would be if they just, you know, if the government decided they didn't like you and went to Apple with an NSL, could Apple create like an invisible device onto your account and replicate your messages? You know, maybe. So probably not necessarily good enough if you were going to run a jihadi campaign against the, uni the United States, probably fine for buying drugs in Oakland. Um, again, it's sort of like various threat models, right? Um, I'm not advocating that you do either of these things. They both sound illegal and you shouldn't. I'm just sort of pointing out that, you know. I think that one of the, the places I've been the most confused not being an expert at all in cybersecurity is about attribution, because attribution is such a big deal in any news story. We all want to know who's at fault, but it's actually really hard as a member of the general public to just understand what that even means, right? So if we were watching a detective show about trying to figure out who's the murderer, how would you actually go about it? How do you figure out who hacks who, and what should we be skeptical of when we are when we're reading the news? That is an excellent question, um, and, and one, one quite dear to my heart, actually. The joke is, is that you know, sort of at attribution is tricky, right? Even if it's accurate and even if it's doable, it can be difficult for the layperson to understand. But it's not so much that attribution is impossible, it's just that it is infrequently done with public sources. <laughs> and so, for instance, like, you know, the NSA says, yes, we are very sure that this is the Russians. And you're like, well, you would say it was the Russians. I remember there was a Cold War and a thing, and our countries don't like each other very much, and you're the NSA, and you kind of lied to us. There was Clapper in Congress. And, and so, you know, I'm really just inclined to believe the things that you say. On the other side of things, they're not going to say, like, well, we know it was the Russians because we had this global passive sensor network, which enables us to ingest 95% of traffic. And so we could actually see here to here, uh, but we have these illegal taps running under country X. So, I mean, right, so, so, so I mean, th th this should kind of explain to you, though, like, frequently why, like, you know, results, not sources and methods, right? Like, people are probably not going to want to explain primarily how they got this information. And, in fact, we've even seen this when it's come to, there have been certain... Uh, court cases involving the the use of stingrays, right, like cellular surveillance devices, where cops have actually decided to ditch cases rather than admit that they were using this technology, right, where like it, it has been deemed important enough that they protect the methods that they're prepared to sort of give away this case. So, I mean, it, it sort of speaks to one of the reasons why attribution is difficult. Having said that, I think that understanding that there's sort of a difference between soft and hard attribution, right? Like hard attribution is like, we definitely know it was this person, we have them on video, we have DNA, there is, there is everything. And frequently that can only really be done in cyber attacks with the cases, like maybe you have leaked documents which prove things. However, you can, for instance, sort of soft attribution. So in the case of the DNC hack, these people have been active for like seven, eight years. Their methods almost identical across the seven, eight years. Almost everybody who's been studying this group thinks it's Russia. They hacked the German parliament. The German intelligence thinks it's Russia. US intelligence thinks it's Russia. They hacked France's largest television station. France thinks it's Russia. So in this case, there's a like, well, I haven't seen the proof myself right now. However, I think that there's sort of a consensus in soft attribution land that this is probably Russia. I guess you can sort of think about these things in, 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 you know, in that sort of, as a spectrum maybe. Americans sort of view privacy as a commodity, that the government should be regulated. You know, people are willing to buy and sell levels of privacy if they get something in return. Whereas Europeans sort of think of it as a right that should be protected by the government. So now with the proliferation of all these social media sites and um, access, you know, wider access to um, the internet, do you think this is going to still per, you know, still stay the same or is it going to change over time? It's, it's actually something that I, I've, I've thought a lot about. In Europe, there is actually a very deep an abiding understanding of privacy rights for reasons that everyone in this room is probably reasonably familiar with. However, free speech is not nearly as valued as much. In the US, 
free speech you can pry it from cold dead hands along with the guns right um but privacy here is as you say it's sort of it, it, you know commoditized you know whether, whether or not you're sort of rich enough to afford it um I, 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 think, I think people here are a lot more worried about it than they have been historically. I lived in Europe for, uh, for, for a number of years, and I would actually get very confused when having these discussions with Europeans, because um, Euro Europeans are frequently very worried about the amount of data the, and information that large US corporates have on, on them. It's complicated, right? But it is very difficult for European governments to convince Google or Facebook not to keep certain types of data or, you know, for them to have any sort of control over it. So, for instance, you feel like your data is not sovereign, right? Like you don't ha really have control over what's being kept or collected about you. Having said that, in America, like, I don't really care what Facebook keeps about me because Facebook doesn't have coercive power of violence. At least I don't think so. Maybe The government, for instance they might actually break into my house and seize my stuff or throw me in jail. And they can do that. Facebook can't. Facebook is going to advertise things at me, which I will probably buy while drunk. There, there's actually quite a, a completely different perspective on it. Um, but I mean, a lot of things are moving very fast in this area. I mean, there was a sort of a safe harbor provision, which sort of between Europe and America, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and the international law on this gets kind of interesting. But basically, um, after the release of, of the Snowden documents, and it sort of came to light the amount of data the US government was gathering, then they actually decided that uh, European data on U.S. soil was never, not actually considered any longer a safe harbor. I, mean, I guess one of the things that we're worried about now is the sort of the warrant responsiveness of really large businesses. I like having my stuff in the cloud because this is my fourth iPhone in like 18 months. Like I smash these all the time. And so I just get a new one and then I punch in some stuff and then it's the same phone and I'm, I'm off again and that's great. <laughs> the downside of this is, is that you know, there's a piece of paper and you know, now who, whoever has legal authority can pour through my life, right? And so I mean, I think that that's, that's one of these things that people have become very, very concerned with as we demand greater convenience with technology that we're really close to, that we even have an intimate relationship with. Look, I have a little pink case on my phone. You start wondering, worrying, right? Like, who has this? Who has control over it? It's not actually me. It's Apple, it's Facebook, it's Google. And so, you know, fortunately, I think all three of those companies at the moment are actually sort of doing reasonable things in terms of pushing back on the government in terms of asking for data. But... What's worrying about that situation is it's about as reliable as, hey, well, Obama is in charge of the largest surveillance apparatus in the world, and he seems like kind of a good guy, so, you know, I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Don't be evil. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk a lot about locking things down as far as how we control our personal representation and what's visible, but I would love to hear a little bit about what we can do to propagate misinformation uh, yeah. and what we can do at <laughs> scale if we're not willing to take the steps necessary to have inconvenient security. Oh, I, I love this. So, so <laughs> there was this, there's this hilarious website called Destroy My Google Search History, right? And so, so you, you browse to it, I mean, this is just an example, but I, I loved it so much because you browse to it and then all of a sudden, like, you, you get this pop-up, which is like, you know, like, you have to be logged in with your Google account. Are you sure you really want to do this? And you're like, yeah, 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 hit me with it. And, you hit, and it just starts searching kind of like, oh, jihadist manuals, all sorts of crazy stuff. But, but it's sort of like hundreds of thousands of searches just rolling into Google. Like all, and it's like, your, your search history is trashed, right? Like <laughs> that, that, that profile that's been building on you and like, you know, oh, you're a 25 to 30 year old liberal who lives in this area and you like driving a Prius and you probably like eating it in and out and stuff like, gone, <laughs> right? Like, um, so it's like, yeah, there are some people thinking about the misinformation game and I happen to think it's pretty hilarious. It, it depends on, on what? Like, if you're going to take it really seriously in terms of your whole life, it sort of goes back to that social media game as well, where that's, that's really difficult, because you have to sort of elect you're going to live your life in a certain way. Having said that, I think there are actually... There are, there are pretty easy ways to stop certain types of tracking and send certain types of misinformation, right? I tell people to use ad blockers all of the time, right? It's like, if you want... I, mean, I used to work for Google. If you want to drastically minimize the amount of information Google has about you, use ad blockers. They all block AdWords, right? Like... Not that I know this for a good, any good reason, but it is reasonably hard to run a long-term fake identity. 
Um, so, so I mean, <laughs> we're just talking about misinformation, right? Like, there's, there's a lot of time and effort involved in this. Actually, Julia Anwin has a really great book called Dragnet Nation, and she, t <laughs> she signs up for fake credit cards, face post office boxes, and all. So it's actually not that hard. There's just a sort of a, a reasonable amount of effort involved. You can't just browse to a website. One might argue we already do this a little bit anyway, right? Like... Who actually presents who they really are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, right? There's, there's a kind of an ideal of, I mean, m maybe you use Twitter specifically for work purposes, right? And Instagram is only photos of you doing yoga because yoga doesn't happen unless it's being Instagrammed. I think actually if, you grow, if you're a digital native, right? Like if you grow up with social media now, then people sort of intrinsically understand that there's actually sort of a curation of, of what they want to keep intimate and, and, and what they actually want to share with other people online. If people have very specific needs with regard to sowing misinformation about themselves online, I, I am more than happy to talk to specifics with individuals after this. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again for being here. <laughs>